Hello, my friends. How are you? This is me, Dr. Sergio Rovinsky from Shoulder Planet here from the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. In this video, I have the honor to present to all of uh, you the first international Shoulder Planet Indo-Brazil webinar. This webinar was a fantastic uh, event that was only possible because of the outstanding efforts of our good friends, Dr. Niraj Bijlani and Dr. Ashok Shyam, both from Ortho TV, and I am very happy to, to present it to you. We had big stalwarts of the shoulders scenario in this event. Dr. Ildeu Almeida, ex-president of Brazilian Shoulder and Elbow Society, and still uh, two fantastic shoulder surgeons from India, Dr. Shirish Patak from the city of Pune and Dr. Sanjay Trivedi from the city of Ahmedabad. It was a two and a half outstanding discussion on biological healing of rotator cuff with lovely lectures, principles, methods, and discussions. So I hope you like it and let's see the video. So uh, welcome to this first Indo-Brazil collaboration webinar and good morning to everybody in Brazil and good afternoon to everybody in India. Uh, we are here together with, to see this uh, webinar on biology of rotator cuff healing and how to improve it. Uh, this is a disclaimer from the author TV. We'd like to thank all our faculty for sharing their knowledge and expertise, especially in this challenging times. We wish all our audience a healthy and safe day ahead, and we hope these webinars add value to your time. These webinars are dependent on a lot of technology and internet speed, which might be unstable at times. So please bear with us for any issues of technology. So. Thanks for attending this webinar again. Over to you, Dr. Sergio. So can I can I speak? Yes, sir. Okay, my my friends. So it's a pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, I'm Dr. Sergio Ravinsky, shoulder and elbow surgeon from uh, Brazil, from Shoulder Planet. Shoulder Planet is my international personal project in shoulder and elbow uh, international medicine and surgical education. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is one of the biggest achievements I have uh, ever done with my project. And I am very thankful uh, for Ortho TV for giving us this wonderful opportunity, which is something very special to me. Uh, none of them would have happened without the tremendous help of two special people, Dr. Ashok Shia. He doesn't need any introductions, nor Dr. Nidaj, who have been doing a tremendous uh, nice work for all of us with not only with Forto TV but with all of these webinars as Dr. Ashok has told in these difficult times that we are all passing through. Uh, we have today here a constellation of big stars and I am very happy to to have them all. So first of all uh, I would like to introduce to all of you guys my good friend Dr. Ildeu. Dr. Ildeu Almeida uh, is a very good friend of mine. He's not only my, co my colleague, I consider him my friend, my good friend. He was the president of uh, our uh, Brazilian here, uh, Brazilian uh, Shoulder and Elbow Society in 2019. And so he's the ex-president of the Brazilian Shoulder and Elbow Society and still uh, uh, besides, he was one of the organizers of the International Shoulder and Elbow Congress last year in 2019. So it's an honor to have him here. He lives in a city which is called Belo Horizonte, which is 500 kilometers from Sao Paulo. It's a very big city. And he's not only a wonderful surgeon, but a very good academicist. So it's a pleasure to have him here and a big honor. Uh, still, we have here my good friend, Dr. Uh, Shirish uh, from Pune, uh, stalwart uh, from the Indian shoulder scenario. Everybody knows him. And still, uh, Dr. Sanjay Trivedi from the city of Ahmedabad. One thing that I haven't mentioned is just that Dr. Ildeu is not only a shoulder and elbow guy for more than 25 years, I guess, I, uh, something like that. But he spent yeah. two years uh, when he started his uh, shoulder practice a long time ago, 
uh, with Dr. Angus Wallace, which is one of the biggest shoulder guys in planet Earth. Nowadays, he's the biggest shoulder guy in UK. And he spent two years uh, with uh, him living in, in Edinburgh, in, in uh, UK. Nottingham. Oh, uh, excuse me? Nottingham. In Nottingham, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So he has a very big, uh, I would say, experience, not only in Brazil, but also abroad. So this is uh, uh, his introduction. So now this is what we are going to follow with all of the help of Dr. Ashok and Dr. Nidas. We will have now, uh, so this is a meeting, a very nice meeting about the biology of rotator cuff healing, which we have been paying attention to a lot in the last years. Uh, a lot of attention has been given in the last 20 years about the biomechanics Sorry. with double row double, uh, and a lot of, of uh, new uh, uh, sutures and uh, suture techniques, but biology is very important too. And we have been seeing a lot of papers about it. Last week, Dr. Ildeu organized a lovely event here in uh, Brazil about biology of the cuff healing and uh, we are continuing this. I'm very happy about that. So this is the sequence. Dr. Ildeu is presenting a, a lecture about 20, 25 minutes. He has all of the time he wishes, of course, about the, uh, a lot of aspects of uh, the uh, biology of the rotator cuff healing and how to improve it. And also Dr. Shirish is gonna show a, a lot of tips with all of his experience. So we are about to have in a sequence, I guess, 40 or 4,500 of beautiful explanations. And then I, I hope we have a lot of time to talk. So I'm very happy to be here. It's an honor. It's a very happy moment in my life. And Dr. Ildeu, it's not only a, a pleasure to have you here, but now the microphone is all yours. Thank you very much um, for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here with you. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the healing process of rotator cuff after the repair. And uh, now I'm going to share my presentation. Thank you. Okay, it's all right. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just a second, please. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the healing process uh, regarding the rotator cuff repair. I work at uh, three different hospitals in Brazil, uh, Felicio Rocho, Vera Cruz, and Horizonte. And this is the team that works with me. I have nothing to declare regarding the conflict of interest. Uh, I work as a consultant for Johnson & Johnson, but mainly for arthroplasties, shoulder arthroplasties. And I have a uh, elbow uh, arthroplasty uh, prosthesis, a Brazilian elbow prosthesis being developed. And yeah, uh, last year, we have uh, published a book about shoulder and elbow fractures here in Brazil. Well, when we talk about the healing processes, we have to take in consideration the local and the systemic factors, the pre and the post-op aspects. Specifically about the systemic factors, we have to take in consideration alcohol, obesity, smoking, cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, immunobiological aspects, genetic and age. When we talk about alcohol, you know that we have more massive tears and the long-term alcohol intake is a very significant risk factor for occurrence and severity of the rotator cuff tear in men and in women as well. So the obesity increases the occurrence and the severity of the rotator cuff tear. And it's very well established that smoking is a great problem. And nicotine reduces this MMP9 expression in tenocytes. What, what is MMP9? It's an enzyme that involved in the extracellular matrix de degradation. So the elasticity modulus of the, the tendon is changed uh, after years of smoking. So there is no point in, in stop smoking before the surgery because the damage is already done, okay? 
And the risk factor for tear in propagation is well established by A.G. Itoy. Cholesterol does the same in the elasticity modulus of the tendon. And diabetes is something that we have to pay attention. In the past, we didn't look for uh, about this pay, the, these aspects. We just uh, indicate the operation and perform it. Now, we know that we need to control the, glyc the, the glycine after the operation. Otherwise, the healing process will be, uh, will be a problem, okay? So, hypertension increases two times the chance of large tears and four times the chance of massive tears. And this is an aspect that we can't control, these immunobiological factors. Um, we know that this participates in the mechanism of fatty degeneration. So some patients are, have a tendency of developing fatty degeneration more than others. And unfortunately, we can't control that. Age is a problem as well. If we understand that the orangotangus at the age of 40 in the jungle is an old animal and has its rotator cuff degenerated, and now we are achieving 100 years and our DNA is 97% identical to it. So we are going to have rotator cuff tear in between 40 to 100 years. So what can we do biologically to improve tendon quality and try to avoid this problem? So that's the next, the next lecture, okay? And Fukuda has defined five different um, parts of the tendons. And uh, he showed us that in a young guy, Wavy pattern, a very well organized tendon. But when we achieve middle age, this tendon is swollen, homogeneous, so we have a degeneration already in the middle age. So these uh, systemic factors are very difficult to control, but some local factors we can, we can try to control. So we have to talk about tear size, muscle, tendon, bone quality, and bone morphology. Regarding tear size, we have to analyze it in both plans, coronal and sagittal. And we use parts classification and coffee basement classification. And we understand if we are going to treat a small tear, we have a chance of 94% of healing. But if we are going to treat a big or a massive tear, the literature shows us that the chance of failure is as high as 97%. This number, 2.2 centimeter, is very important to remember. When we consider the tear in a sagittal plan, if you have a tear higher than, greater than 2.2 centimeters, you are going to have only 49% of healing. But if the tear is less than two centimeters, you are going to have 72% of healing. So when the tear is greater than two centimeters, it almost is always involving this infraspinatus. So this is something that we have to remember when we, we have an MRI in front of us. Regarding the retraction, the tendon retraction, the tendon retraction is not always due to the muscle that pulls it. It, it's due to the uh, tendon to bone reminiscent because some tears are in the middle of the tendon. They are not only avulsions. So in this case, the tendon is short. And then when we are going to repair it, if you repair it in the proper footprint, you are going to be over tension. So in these situations, it's better to repair it a little bit medially. I know that Dr. Rovinsky likes to, to do these repairs a little bit medially. And, and this is a reason for that, to restore the proper tension. The tendon resorption as, uh, occurs as well in the board of this because of the necrosis. So uh, this is a problem that we have to consider during operation. If we have uh, a retraction 
greater than two centimeters, we are going to have only 47% uh, of helium. And if it's less than two centimeters, it's 76%, so it's higher. So we have to talk to our patients and explain them the chance of success of our procedures. Regarding the coronal plan, well, we pay attention during the MRI about muscle and about tendons, but we have to pay attention about musculotendinous junction. This concept uh, we sometimes forget. And if we have the musculotendinous junction lateral to the glenoid, we are going to have uh, a great chance of healing. But if it's medial to the, the glenoid, uh, you have a high chance of failure. So that's another criteria to use it. Well, but uh, muscle atrophy and fatty degeneration is very uh, used uh, for a long time now. Then uh, we use the Gutelier classification. And if we have a type one or type two, it's, we have a 75% chance of healing. But for five uh, types three or four, we have only 41% of healing. And uh, t talking about muscle atrophy, you have to calculate the muscle occupation in the supraspinatus, supraspinatus fossa. If we have less than 43% of muscle occupation, we will have a high rate of retear. So we have lots of criteria to, to, to use to understand the chance of success of our procedures. Well, tendon quality. When we talk about tendon quality, we have to pay attention about delamination because delamination is related to prognosis, is related to chronicity, and the tendon is thinner than before. So when we have a look at the tendon during arthroscopy, we try to understand the quality of the tendon. Is it uh, reliable? Well, this paper shows us that there is no correlation between macroscopic and microscopic findings or arthroscopic findings related to the tendon healing. So we simply can't predict if our tendon is going to heal properly based on our arthroscopy. And how to understand, how to identify the lamination doing an arthroscopy. The majority of the surgeons do not change from the posterior portal to the lateral portal. And the, the adequate way to see, to identify the lamination is using the lateral portal. It's a gold standard. So we need to change our practice. And before doing the repair, we have to change the, the arthroscope from the posterior portal to the lateral portal. And then go back to the posterior portal and start doing the procedure, okay? This paper analyzed 1,043 patients and they said that there is a, a delamination is not an independent factor. It might be related to other factors like osteoporosis, chronicity, uh, tendon retraction as well. And can we predict bone healing based on bone morphology? This is something that I, uh, I understand that we can do using the, the critical shoulder angle. The critical shoulder angle is the, the, the third image on the right, okay? Uh, if you calculate the critical shoulder angle, and if it's greater than 38 degrees, it means that you have, you can predict, you can tell to the patient if, they, if the patient does not have a rotator cuff tear, that the chance of having a rotator cuff tear in the future is greater than if the critical shoulder angle is less than 38 degrees. So, if you have a critical shoulder angle of 32 degrees, for example, the chance is of developing arthritis, not rotator cuff tear. 
and it's related to curve healing. If you have a greater uh, critical shoulder angle above 38 degrees, you have less chance of curve healing. So what we can do during the procedure, trying to avoid this, uh, heal, uh, this impact on healing process, you can do a lateral acromioplasty. So as described by Christian Gerber, trying to avoid uh, uh, impingement after the operation. Bone quality is related to, to complications. So if you have a chronic tear, you might have a greater chance of anchor pullout. So you have to talk to the patients or to change our technique, increasing, increasing the strength of the bone strength. Some guys, they use uh, methyl metacrylate or some guys change from anchors to transosseal suture. Well, uh, this is an interesting paper and they tried to, to create an index for cuff healing. And they used some uh, criteria as age, size of the tear, retraction of the tendon, Gutalier classification, bone quality, and work activity. So you have 15 points. And if you have less than four points, you have a great chance of healing. But if you have more than five points, you have uh, uh, a great chance of complications. Uh, we, we know based on the, uh, what we have spoken before that we have lots of other criteria to take in consideration, but this index is established and is something that we can use it. Now we have to talk a little bit, a bit about preoperative aspects. Per operative aspects. So we're going to talk a little bit about techniques, but I'm not going to talk about the biology of it because this is the next presentation. To, to choose the technique, we have to dominate the principles. So we have lots of options. You can do transosseal suture atroscopically or open. You can do suture bridge, double or single row, but you need to know the basic concepts. And the basic concepts, they were established since 1994 by Christian Gerber to 2016 by King. And they, they took in consideration rigidity, strength, stability, tension, gap, contact pressure. And we are going to talk a little bit about these techniques. So what kind of surgical strategies do we have to reconstruct the rotator cuff tear? So we have var various construct configurations and we have many factors that contribute to structural integrity of the repair. These include repaired rotator cuff tendon footprint motion. So what kind of mobility we have mm -hmm. after our repair. Increased tendon footprint contact area pressure. So uh, what kind of procedure we are doing and what kind of pressure we have between the tendon to the bone and increasing tissue quality tendon to bone. In these cases, we can use biological uh, uh, issues to increase the bone quality and the tendon quality. Well, let's talk about single row, which is the most used uh, uh, procedure in the world. But it's less expensive, it's uh, less demanding, and, but uh, we have just 67% of cover, uh, covering the footprint using a single row. But the functional results are not bad. They are similar to double row. So that's the procedure I do in the majority of the cases. In some specific cases, it's better to do a double row. In the double row technique, you increase the footprint, the contact, the footprint area covered but you not increase that much the contact between the tendon and the bone. So to do that, you can do a suture bridge technique. So the pressure between the contact area between the tendon and the bone is greater, but it might compromise vascularity. So uh, you, you can have uh, 
all the best things from one, one procedure. Yeah? Well, if I'm going to, to have my rotator cuff repaired, I would prefer to have this right X-ray after the operation than the, 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 the left one. So a uh, trans ulcer suture is an option. And uh, Alex Castagna has described this procedure in his, on his book uh, using these guides, LCA guides or shoulder guides to do a trans ulcer suture. And, well, after doing the procedure, we have to pay attention about some aspects. Otherwise, we are going to have failure. And I just use non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs in the first two or three days to control pain because I like to do a multimodal uh, control of the pain. Uh, if we use non-steroid inflammatory drugs for more than three, four, four days, we are going to have a bad effect on the healing process. Uh, regarding rehabilitation, we can uh, choose from an early passive motion protocol to a delayed range of motion protocol. And here, I have some doubts because uh, some people say, if you uh, perform a delayed protocol, you are going to have more stiffness. I'm not sure about that. I think that the stiff shoulder stiffness is more related to other aspects of the patients, much more than the time that you use for immobilization. So, Sometimes we, we, we do an early passive motion protocol and the patient uh, becomes stiff anyway. So I think the, the sensibility, the, the pain control, the psychological aspects of the patient, and much other, uh, the reaction, the biological uh, re response from the body to the procedure is another uh, uh, aspect to be considered as well. And, but this paper uh, talk uh, a lot about uh, that stiffness is a complication that you can treat, but uh, non-healing is a failure and it's a, a major problem. So that's something for us to discuss, okay? Well, immobilization. Most of the surgeons tell to the patients to keep this link for six, five to six weeks after the, the procedure. But uh, the literature tells us that we, if we use for four weeks is okay. There is no support for using more than, than uh, four weeks. But after the procedure, if the patient is an old patient, the bone quality is poor, the tendon is very thin, we, we try to use this link for more than four weeks in the majority of the cases. And the abduction link is another thing that uh, it might uh, be okay for reducing pain, but there is no support for using abduction sling regarding the healing process. It does not, uh, it's not proven that it improves the healing process. So that's something that should be discussed as well. Well, I'm very open to the questions in the end of the, the presentations and thank you very much for the opportunity. Hello. Yes. So, my friend, uh, are you there? Are you listening to me? Yes, very much indeed. Okay, good. So, see, uh, I'm very happy because uh, you mentioned a lot of stuff that we can discuss a lot of things. This is going to be not very, not not only really good for us, but very good for the audience, which uh, doesn't have so much, I would say, uh, experience with all of these things. But I noted a lot of things that. We it's going to be very nice. And now Dr. Shirish is going to talk about his experience with, uh, with uh, enhancing the biology. He has a, a lot of experience, of course. So let's uh, hear it and then we can start a, a nice discussion, not only between us, but obviously with the audience. So Shirish, the screen is all yours. Uh, Sergio, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, very good. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my friend Sergio from Brazil for involving me in this first Indo-Brazil uh, webinar. I'm very happy. 
uh, and also uh, ortho tv team dr ashok and neer on the ortho tv so i think uh, whatever uh, dr udo has already mentioned whatever i'm going to talk is in continuity with what we have discussed so let me start with my presentation <clears throat> so enhancing biology of arthroscopic cuff repair how do i do it so as we know rotator cuff disease is prevalent in the aging population and is the most common cause of shoulder pain and disability what are the indication for cuff repair by and large a full thickness tear with severe pain and disability weak abduction which is not responding to conservative treatment and the person who is active irrespective of his uh, uh, age uh, i would take into consideration the physiological age i think he becomes a suitable candidate for cuff repair after adequate counseling the surgical goal of cuff repair is to create a low tension stable repair construct which is strong enough to sustain till biology takes over now i'm going to show you a video this is a i would say a large rotator cuff tear a u shape involving supra and infra spinatus you can see glenoid and retractability quite repairable the footprint is almost covered fully now in second video you can see i am create i have created a nice footprint i have done a micro fracture to create more growth factors at the footprint for better biology and healing and then my anchor construct with double row repair with transosseous equivalent this is the final picture okay now my question if is if i ask you whether this repair is going to heal and give a good functional outcome will you be able to answer i think it is very difficult because it is not only the arthroscopic procedure but there are so many factors which are playing role and which will effectively give a better biological healing at the rotator cuff and in first lecture we have listened there are so many patient factors local factors tear pattern factors so one by one i am going to go through that so if at all if this repair heals we need to ask ourselves why this has healed and if it does not heal we have to ask ourselves why it has not healed i think we always see macroscopically the rotator cuff and we are very proud that we repair them anatomically as far as possible but at the same time as a surgeon we should or need to know some basic science first we should know what is microscopic anatomy of tendon and the tendon bone junction what happens at cellular level when tendon tears what are phases of tendon biological healing what are factors which affect biological healing which stimulate or inhibits biological healing and last which is very clinically relevant is how to improve biology so what option do we have at our hands so that we can effectively improve the biology now let us start with the histology of the tendon so as we all know the extracellular matrix of a tendon 85% is collagen rest is non collagen protein which includes proteoglycans and gags it's very important to understand it is primarily a type 1 collagen 95% is type 1 collagen and the cells are called tenocytes or fibroblast and there are certain cells which are around the tendon peritendon sheath cell so both have important role in laying down the collagen now tendon bone junction we have to understand the different parts of muscle tendon and how it inserts onto the bone it is very relevant when you do a arthroscopic cuff repair now we know myotendinous junction is the weakest link but we have to take a look how it inserts so we have a tendon then we have a fibrocartilage then a calcified fibrocartilage and then the bone so this transition is very important and when we repair tendon we hope that this sort of architecture will be 
reproduced or it will eventually get remodeled to this sort of anatomy to give the best possible result near anatomy. Now, what are phases of rotator cuff healing? I think this is very relevant because it is going to dictate not only your technique, but also your post-operative rehab protocol and the restriction of activity and how to go about increasing activity and eventually the strengthening. So the first step is inflammatory, which, which is there for about five to seven days. Then is the stage of repair, which is roughly up to three months. And the last stage is stage of remodeling, where you gain the maximal tensile strength, which happens roughly about three months and it goes on for a few weeks more. So now it is very important to understand the first is the inflammation. Second is a repair where a type 3 collagen is being produced, which is not the right collagen for the tendon. But remodeling is a stage where this type 3 collagen is going to get converted into type 1 by a cellular cascade, which is very important. So if you are able to achieve a type 1 collagen, a nicely healed tendon at the end, then that's going to give you the best outcome, best functional outcome and strength. So I would like to go through few steps because I thought it is very important as a surgeon to understand what is happening. So if there is the acute rotator cuff tear, then what happens at the cellular level? So in inflammatory phase, which is roughly first one week, the injured tissue is going to release the cytokines. These cytokines causes neutrophil attraction and mobilization. These neutrophils, they release interleukin 1b and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which are the primary inflammatory cytokines. And they activate nuclear factor kappa b, which leads to the process of apoptosis in musculotendinous units. So this happens precisely if we leave that tear without repair or if we just ignore it, leave it, then this apoptosis is going to lead to further loss, further tissue damage, muscle atrophy, and eventually fat infiltration. But if we repair it or if it is a partial tear which has got potential to heal, then probably it will go to the second stage, which is of stage of repair where musculotendinous units now will, will start anti-inflammatory effect and they will start regenerative process where they will create pro-fibrotic factors from extracellular matrix and now uh, multiple growth factors like transforming growth factors, IGF, PGDF, GDF. These are all uh, platelet growth derived factors, Mul many of them and they act synergistically, they clear the dead tissue and stimulate regeneration. And now in later part of this uh, inflammation and start of the repair, macrophages, they come in action and angiogenesis and fibroblastic activity starts, which primarily secretes collagen type three. So we have to understand from the basic science that the reformation of normal tendon bone attachment takes at least 24 weeks based on histological analysis. So the strength of rotator tendon repair is very low in animal model when measured in first six weeks. And I think it will corroborate in human model as well. So now we have to understand, coming back to the same question, the tendon which we have repaired, is it going to heal? Is it going to repair? So we have to look into the literature. So if you see, there's so much literature telling us about overall healing rates and these healing rates, as rightly mentioned earlier, they vary from 60 to 90%. And for large tear, even they have reported healing rate less than 10% also. So we have to understand most of our repairs are not actually getting healed, which range from 10 to 30% and maybe even more. So it is very clear that the healing is very less than we thought previously. And then in ignited controversy, whether 
open orthoscopic whether a single row double row whether a suture configuration whether a type of anchor whether the post op rehab protocol which is playing an important role and leading to less biology and more retail rates so does healing really matter that is another question whatever you have repaired if it heals well then it has been proven in literature a healed intact rotator cuff is going to give you a far better functional and clinical outcome and strength as compared to the one which is partly healed or not at all healed so the problem here i think is the poor biological healing so we have to look into the factors so i would go quickly through this because most of these factors have been already covered so i would like to divide them as patient factors surgeon factors and of course the rehab protocol and then miscellaneous factors so in patient factors so these are all patient factors which tells me before surgery that this candidate is a candidate where there is a poor biology so increased age uncontrolled diabetic uncontrolled hypercholesterolemia use of recurrent nsaid for a pretty long time the smoker uh, osteoporotic vitamin d deficient patient these are the patient who are poor biology patient for me so i am going to be little careful and counsel them and try to correct the correctable factors whatever possible to give a better biology now cuff tear pattern so acute versus chronic it has been proven in literature that if you repair them early the healing rates are far superior because as you have seen the process of biological healing if you intervene at a repair stage then it is going to complement the healing process by giving anatomically repaired tendon again the size grade of retraction tendon loss fatty atrophy everything plays a very important role already discussed so i would skip this uh, uh, reference because they have been already covered only to mention that if the age advances the percentage of cuff healing is going to go down and if the tear size goes up again the healing rates are going to drop this is the bottom line osteoporosis again is a independent risk factor and as correctly mentioned in earlier lecture if there is a back out of the suture anchor before it biology the cuff biologically heals well there is going to be high rate of failure leading to bad result so we have to be very careful while choosing our patient if we have osteoporotic patient then you should be ready with alternative option of suture anchor or alternative suture repair techniques so just similar to the scoring system what dr edo mentioned i would classify my cuff tear scenario in three groups favorable unfavorable and hopeless group so favorable is a younger patient less than 65 smaller tear typically traumatic ones who present early minimally retracted with good muscle bulk gotalier 1 or max 2 these are good good biology good result unfavorable age more than 65 large tears grade 2 retraction tendon loss and grade 3 or 4 grade 3 gutalier poor biology relatively and this is the last group where i would not repair the cuff tear rather i would look for other options if patient is more than 70 with grade 4 retraction osteoporotic bone i may think in term of reverse shoulder orthoplasty or just leave them alone with the good rehab now surgical technique does it make difference in the healing i think yes if fixation is unable to handle the post op loads biology just cannot compensate so we have to make the best environment best situation for the cuff to heal and the cuff to be biomechanically strong enough till the biological bonds develop between the tendon and the bone so again surgeon factors the level of expertise 
ability to understand the tear pattern, uh, mobilization techniques, repair techniques, uh, properly done single row and a properly done double row, and most importantly, the augmentation of biology. I think each and every point in this slide is for better biology. Have to, you can't say the biology is something different, which is like a holy grail, which I'm going to add later. No, it starts from the selection of patient and step by step with your every surgical step. So I would summarize, if you do your mechanical job correctly, then you are trying to improve the biology. So you have a correct suture strength, multiple suture, correct suture configuration, adequate number of sutures anchor, right technique, nicely prepare bone footprint, do subacromial decompression, microfracture. You can do this irrespective of whether you're doing single row or double row. Because some tears will dictate you to do a single row repair. So never mind, you can do whatever technique you want to follow, but follow this and you will give a very good mechanical uh, construct leading to best biology possible. We all know there are a lot of biomechanical data on cadaveric study, lab study, that double row repair gives a better fixation better contact between tendon and bone, increased load to failure, less gap formation, and increased cyclic load to failure. So I think that has you know, led to a better initial strength fixation and better results with newer double row repair techniques. So to summarize, I think it appears that there is definitely a structural uh, benefit of structural healing when you do a double row fixation as opposed to single row fixation. This is more applicable for tears which are more than three centimeters. Now we are talking about the healing. The functional outcome may be not so much different, but if you see the healing patterns, I think with double row, it is definitely better. If you're doing a medialized low tension single row repair, don't forget to open up the channels on the lateral part of the footprint, which has been popularized by Professor Schneider, which is, he calls it a crimson duvet, where he gives the bone marrow veins to create more growth factors, super clot formation leading to better biological healing. Now coming to the post rehab protocol, I think this has been already covered. So there is a lot of conflicting evidence, early versus delayed. So recent JBJS review concludes that there is no difference in retail, even if you start early mobilization. But it is very important to understand, you can't apply same rules for all patients. It has to be individualized decision when you are dealing with large and massive cup, cuff tears. It is better to give time for biology to take place and better healing than be in a hurry to get early range of moment. So go slow if it is a large or massive tear. Now there are a lot of option in market available to augment the biology. So we would divide them into three types, Tino inductive, Tino conductive and Tino productive. So let us go one by one. So what is Tino conductive? So these are nothing but scaffolds. So there are scaffolds available commercially. There are three types, xenografts made from porcine, a dermal or submucosal patches. In India, very few are available and exorbitant cost is the problem of using them. Then allografts, there are certain graft jackets, human dermal patches and synthetic grafts, so Gore-Tex patches. So these are scaffolds which will definitely help you and they have a limited role in large retracted cuff tears to augment the biology. Now, second group is tenoproductive. Now, this is a whole orthobiologics which is coming up. Still, we don't have a very good evidence to use them, but we definitely know that they are proving beneficial day by day. So there are two types of cells, adult and embryonic stem cells. The adult stem cells are primarily multipotent mesenchymal stem cells. You can harvest them from bone marrow or adipose tissue. 
and there are placenta derived pluripotent stem cells so they have capacity to transform themselves to any type of uh, tissue so here if you use these mesenchymal stem cells and give them the right environment then they probably will differentiate into a rotator cuff tissue giving a better biology and a better heal and the last is the tino inductin so i think these are nothing but the all growth factors cytokines so what we studied or discussed during a repair phase these are all cytokines they are produced by body as a response to create repair but if they are available at your hand then probably you can add them during repair and hope to have a better biology because they play important role in migration proliferation and differentiation and a single growth factor is not going to help you but multiple growth factors they act synergistically and give you best results so there are uh, transforming growth factors bone morphogenic protein 12 so there are plenty of them available now the last group which i'm going to discuss is the platelet rich plasma the best way to get autologous growth factors in a better concentration is the platelet rich plasma so platelet can give you a lot of growth factor tgfb pdgf uh, vegf egf igf see you can go to the long form in insulin growth factors you know vascular endothelial growth factors plenty of them so a simple technique of centrifuging them and separating plasma platelet leukocyte and rbc can help you to get a concentrate of these growth factors which have which has got a you know small uh, uh, put them at right timing then probably they is, they are going to help you in healing so there are four types of prp available in the market so there is again debate going on leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor then plasma and fibrin pure prp so uh, it's still debatable but there is some benefit proven in literature lot of animal studies and few uh, uh, trials on human subjects also claim good results so let us go one by one so you have two types of prp one is leukocyte rich and one is leukocyte poor leukocyte rich is where you want to induce inflammation like where you want to do like lateral epicondylitis you can use leukocyte rich while poor is something which you would like to use uh, for cuff repair where you want to primarily give uh, regeneration and prf is the uh, platelet rich fibrin if you add uh, calcium and if you activate the platelet then eventually it is going to form a thrombin and leading to a platelet rich fibrin matrix so the advantage is uh, it become it forms like a matrix membrane so you can put it wherever you want like a patch so it has been used effectively in rotator cuff repairs and meniscal repair so instead of injecting you can actually place it and incorporate in sutures to give a better biological augmentation Uh, so this is the current recommendation for use of platelet rich plasma but we know for specifically cuff repair there is lack of data still it is uh, i would say experimental now the recommendation for biologic therapy in rotator cuff is uh, prp has not been shown to improve healing rates or uh, uh, you know uh, reducing retail rate but they have said it definitely has got some adjuvant role in reduction of pain and there has been uh, some benefit in small to medium size tear in high risk patient where you uh, know that biology is poor and uh, biological patches uh, augments with growth factors implanted on them they have definitely some role as uh, dermal patches in large and massive rotator cuffs so this is what current guideline in 2018 and 19 tells us so just to summarize biological augmentation strategy so at one hand you have scaffolds at one hand you have cells like bone marrow cell mesenchymal cell and then you have bioactive molecules like platelet derived growth factors so now you would ask me whether i use them in my practice 
unfortunately uh, i use them in few of my patient but still there is no current evidence and it adds lot of cost but what i do is i utilize the local uh, anatomy local procedure to give this growth factors so it has been proven that if you do a acromioplasty then it gives you a lot of growth factors like platelet derived growth factors and plenty of them and there is a study where uh, uh, pietro randelli did and he took 2 cc of fluid from subacromial space after doing acromioplasty and compared with the another group where acromioplasty was not done and they found the concentration of growth factors was too high like a prp in patient where you have done a thorough acromioplasty so i make it a point that i may not do a formal acromioplasty for all of my patient but majority of them i do a thorough tuberoplasty on greater tuberosity side and a thorough uh, or uh, judicious acromioplasty on the acromial side to create this growth factors which help in biological healing of my patients so in summary i would say to optimize biology it will start right from selecting right cases do early repair if possible do double row repair augment your repair with microfracture do judicious acromioplasty which is going to give you a free local prp ask patient to stop smoking at least in perioperative period it will to some extent help you in biological healing don't use non steroidal anti inflammatory medication for a very long time you can use uh, these medication as and when required we solely rely on endoscaline blocks and patches in immediate post op period and of course you have to have a individualized physio protocol to prevent re tear because of too much aggressive uh, physiotherapy in early uh, post operative period thank you thank you for your patient listening hello yes sir ji oh, okay so see folks that was a lovely presentation showing a lot of things i made a lot of uh notes uh, we 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 could be discussing this for for the whole day uh but i think we can do a nice discussion now uh, i have a lot of things to to mention and and obviously everybody can say whatever they wish but i think that we must uh, pay a lot of uh, i would say attention with the audience we have beginners not experienced uh, surgeons as uh, all of us are and uh, dr ashok was telling me about some basic things that people were asking we have basically uh three questions the prp was uh, already answered about uh, by 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 you shirish but we can discuss but there is uh, two questions that i would like to start with and uh, the first one is very basic how i'm going to uh, reply and then a second one i'm going to give my uh, feelings because uh, as dr ildeo mentioned i have a, a good experience with that as all of us but i'm going to mention and then i would like to know what you guys think about and we can discuss this so the first one is there is a very basic question is about which are the the mri findings that can uh, predict a worse uh, uh respond a worse outcome so this is a very basic one but i think we must mention to the audience which is when the lesion is uh, retracted or uh, uh, i'd say medially to the glenoid this is a very bad predictor sign or uh, as dr eudeo has mentioned after 2.5 or 3 cm this uh, is something that would lead to a worse outcome in spite of the fact that i have a lot of experience with big tears and i'm going to comment upon that in uh, as we discuss and of course the gutalier classification as all of us know we when you have more than 50% that would i uh, would say uh, lead to a, a less not to mandatorily a bad outcome but to a, a, a less we, we can less expect a, a, i would say a quite predictable good outcome this is quite uh, i would say uh, 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 mentioned in in literature 
But the second one is about detention. So uh, someone was asking, how do you do, how do you manage to, to get attention uh, free and how do you decide it intraoperatively? So this is very easy to me because I uh, use it all of the time as all of us, but I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit ab about this with medialization. What you must do is to do a lot of releases and then to, 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 to pick up the tendon and to pull it and to see how much does it cover the footprint. And as long as it doesn't cover, you don't have to fight with it, but rather than that to uh, achieve a tension-free repair, which is something that I decide, I would say with my eyes macroscopically. And if I have a doubt, uh, I do the medialization of the footprint. So what I've been seeing over these years and Snyder said is, is that as long as you do attention free and I decided with my eyes macroscopically, uh, after some time, the scar will cover all of the footprint. And, and I have uh, four cases in my life so far. I showed it to Dr. Ildeo five days ago, six, in which when you do an MRI one year after the surgery, the footprint is covered. So as long as you do attention free, which you decide macroscopically with or without medial, um, medialization, uh, it will heal. So my decision is absolutely with my eyes and uh, after a lot of releases, and if I have a doubt, I don't spend a minute, I'm talking about big tears, of course, in medializing the footprint. So I, I would like to know you guys, if you think the same, and if not, how do you, uh, I would say, interpret attention-free repair intraoperatively? And this is very uh, important for the audience. So now I open the, the mic. Dr. Yudeo, how do you manage to, would say, decide what is a tension-free or a, a, a repair with tension intraoperatively? Yes. Um, regarding tension, I think we have to talk a little bit about a basic concept, which is the rotator cuff cables. Um, we have the anterior cable, which is uh, the superior border of subscap and the coracohumeral ligament. And we have the posterior cable, which is a little bit post posterior inferior. So it's the anterior cable and the cable, posterior cable, which is in between infraspinatus and teres minor. So we have some balance. So we do not need to cover the, the humeral head completely in chronic and in massive tears. So if we uh, have this balance achieved after the operation, so we might have uh, improved the function and decrease the pain. So uh, first of all, as I said, we need to put the arthroscope on the lateral uh, portal. And we have to, to feel the elasticity of the tendon and the quality of the tendon if it's... Uh, a good quality or bad quality. It's, it's, it's not related to healing, but it's related to the tension and uh, where you are going to put your stitch. This, uh, sometimes when you uh, have an MRI with a massive tear after a small trauma, an old patient at home. For, uh, so uh, some tears are chronic ones and others are acute ones. So you have to pay attention, not to try to repair the old and chronic tears because the patient, the patient was very good with that te tear. And very Imbalance. adapted. And very adapted. Adapted. So yes. you just have to reconstruct the acute one. So if possible, you do the, the chronic one, but there is no point in trying to put it over tension. So you have to feel the tension. It's something difficult to explain by uh, using words. You have, uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, during your practice and, and with another surgeons, you will balance the tendons and, uh, and see the proper uh, place to put the steps. But just, 
just one thing, just one thing. So uh, you, you gave the, the, you have the same feeling that I have, and I'm very happy with it. But see, uh, I this is something that I see case by case with my eyes. There is not, a, I would say, a receipt, a cake receipt. So I think that you do the same. Uh, 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 it's a matter of uh, feeling in every case, uh, how much can you pull and you say in, at some point, that's enough that the, the max uh, I can pull it and you can fix it. I would say, uh, let me use the expression in situ and that's it. I, I guess that, that that's exactly what you do. And uh, it's a feeling, it, uh, I, I would say intra-op in every case. Huh? Yes, uh, I think we have to pay attention about the release, the amount of release we perform. Because uh, during the posterior superior release, we have the suprascapular nerve. So I don't know how do, do you do the release, uh, if you use the, the shaver for that, or if you use the, the bone... bone uh, uh, the periosteal... The periosteal uh, yes. The, yes. The arthroscopic, the arthroscopic periosteal elevator. Is exactly. So I had uh, uh, at least two cases of uh, suprascapular nerve damage doing a very uh, big, big release. Big, uh, yes. So uh, the, the, the French guys, they say that some uh, uh, degeneration of the cuff is, uh, is related to the retraction of the rotator cuff and compromising the suprascapular nerve. So doing a balance you are going to decompress the suprascapular nerve and Mr. increase. Mr. Second, this is, uh, I, I want you to comment about, because many few people know in the audience, this is what Laurent Lafosse calls as the shoulder carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so, but what, it, what literature says is that when you pull down, uh, when you, uh, I would say, when you fix the tendon, you would be releasing the nerve as a, a uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, Lafosse does. Uh, he talks. He talks about it. But uh, and I guess that you feel the same, huh? Yes. There is something else I would like to add, which is the traumatic tears, because uh, we we say that the retraction is a poor prognosis aspect. But in the traumatic tears, uh, if the patient is is a very strong guy. Sometimes you have a lot of retraction, but during the operation, you see that it's very easy to, to bring the tendon to the proper place. So uh, you have to take it in consideration before the surgery. Yeah, so see, you mentioned something that I really care about and, and I'm gonna comment my way and I'm, I would like to know how Shirish thinks about it and Dr. Sanjay. You told me, how do I do releases? Huh? So you see, so above the cuff, I, I go with electrocautery because there is much bleeding uh, on the bursal side. So if you go with the shaver, it bleeds a lot and you take a lot of time to stop the bleeding. So I do the with electrocautery, radio frequency device. I don't care about the nerve because the nerve is below the tendon, but I care too much about damaging the suprascapular nerve. So I go with the periosteal elevator, but no more than I would say one centimeter medial to the superior board of glenoid. And I have a lot of fear of damaging the suprascapular nerve. And so far, hopefully, uh, I had not problems with that. But so I would like to ask Sanjay and Shirish, how do you do your releases and how much do you fear damaging the suprascapular nerve? Right. This is a very important uh, question that Dr. Ildeo has mentioned, and especially for beginners, they must understand that you cannot be very uh, aggressive. You must go with care, especially regarding the suprascapular nerve when doing releases. Sanjay, what do you think yeah. about it? And then Shirish, please. Yeah, Dr. Almeida and Shirish, excellent uh, overview of the healing process and the factors affecting the healing for the rotator cuff. You haven't left uh, anything untouched, but only one thing for the beginners we need to understand that today's keyword is low tension repair. And that is the buzzword in the today's uh, 2020 era. So very uh, aptly asked by uh, one of our uh, listeners that how to measure the tension. Now, before coming to that, 
when you enter into the subacromial space or first when you look at the calf without any bursectomy or anything, there would be a great deal of tension in the calf when you try to catch and hold and uh, you know, uh, try to bring it to the footprint. Uh, you need to understand the tear patterns also to access the uh, you know, tension into the calf. And you need to grab from anterior uh, cuff tissue and bring it to the uh, you know footprint to the uh, to the posterior footprint. You need to catch hold of the central portion and try to bring it there. So once you are able to uh, you know identify L or reverse L, seemingly high tension repairable cuff would become an extremely low tension repairable cuff. So that you need to understand. Secondly, once you've done that you must assess the tension before the release and after the release because there is going to be a huge difference in these two stages. So what I do typically, I coracohumeral ligament or anterior release is very important. I do that and then I pay my attention, I bring my attention to the spine of the scapula. And when I erase the bursa from the spine of the scapula without damaging any of the muscle fiber or, or tissue or nerve, I'm able to get a great deal of excursion of the uh, cuff, you know, laterally, because by uh, bursa, uh, it is attached there. Yeah, just a second. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just for the audience to understand that as Burkhardt said, the cuff, it doesn't come from medial to lateral, but from posterior medial to anterior lateral. So what you have said is absolutely, I would say, uh, I agree because I see this all of the time. You doesn't come, you doesn't, you doesn't pull the, especially the posterior part of the posterior superior cuff, just lateral, but lateral anteri anteriorly, because the, the cuff doesn't go from lateral to me, from medial to lateral, but from posterior medial to anterior lateral. And, but still, Sanjay, uh, how much do you fear damaging uh, the suprascapular nerve when doing the releases? Because this question from Ildeo is a, a key point. Right. So you got to be extremely cautious uh, to not go beyond your spine of the scapula once you make it bare. You do not go medial to that, at least in the anterior, just anterior to the spine of the scapula. That is where you might end up with the trouble and you don't need to release that uh, part. Once you erase your bursa from the spine of the cap, uh, scapula, most of your release is achieved as far as the center portion of the cuff is concerned. And sometimes uh, apparently U-shaped tear is a posterior, posterior tear and you can you know, bring it uh, anteriorly and uh, laterally very easily. To quantify the tension into the cuff tear, there has been papers quantifying the appropriate tension in the cuff repair. And, and if I can share my screen, I can just uh, you know, uh, show you this paper in which they have, now, now this yeah. is the Korean paper, it is a retrospective study and, and they have defined this tension that, you know, what they did, they checked the integrity of calf at the end of, uh, you know, 24 months by MRI. So they decided, they defined that greater than 35 Newton tension is a too much tension. And this has been published in the arthroscopy in November 2020. So this is a fairly recent. So 25 Newton is the, you know, cutoff tension limit. Less than that, you are good enough. More than that, it is bad for the calf healing. Yes, more than that, you will be in danger. Uh, that's exactly what I feel. That's a lovely explanation, but I would like Shirish to give his thoughts about it, Shirish. Yeah, I think most of the points are covered, but uh, while doing arthroscopy, what I would do typically is uh, put a traction suture in the lateral edge of the torn cuff tendon. And after every release, I would check how much mobilization I have achieved. I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to underdo it. Second, 
when i do my cuff repairs my arm is almost by side i do it in lateral position i release the vertical traction so arm is almost by side so that it opens up subacromial space very well so when arm is almost by side maybe 1050 degree of abduction and if i do a low tension repair which is very easy to get it to footprint if there is a tendon loss i don't try to pull it too much to cover the whole footprint yes i take yeah. into the consideration of the loss part of the tendon and then i don't mind medializing it and repair it that's how rough judgment of the tensioning i do it and i agree i i release ch ligament anteriorly for sure to mobilize the anterior leaflet posteriorly i don't do interval release between supra and infra spinatus because i think it's a conjoint tendon i want to maintain the integrity and i would use a blunt periosteum elevator as you rightly said so that there is no chance of damaging supra scapular now yes so uh, this is something i would like to mention because there are uh, i would say uh, blunt blunt instruments uh, like the periosteal elevator but shams some they are i would say more uh, sharp like a, a, an arthroscopic osteotome and you shall not use it of course just blunt but see um, many questions they are coming I, i would just mention that i don't do uh, posterior interval slides and anterior interval slides there is a, a question coming about it i would i would just to look i, I think we we don't have to to talk too much about it so, so many things to discuss but any of you guys like to do posterior or anterior interval slides because the answer is i don't do it but uh shirish doesn't do it so uh i don't Hassan, do it as well no <laughs> dr Udeo, do you have any concerns because i don't do it Yes, so I would like to just to, to say something about the the uh, postoperative uh, recover of of strength. Uh, you might have some patients that do recover the abduction strength, but do not recover the external rotation ones, and we say that ah, that's because the infraspinatus is uh, poor prognosis muscle. But I believe that some of these cases is that because we have damage. The, the suprascapular part of the nerve that goes through the infraspinatus. So uh, the problem is that we do not uh, study this problem properly. We do not uh, ask uh, the electro... Uh, myography. Uh, yes, myography for these cases. So we, we simply do not have the diagnosis done. And I think that we, we should pay attention about these cases a little bit more. Uh, yeah okay so uh another thing that that is coming i think that we we have a lot of things to discuss but i i want to give attention to the audience the thing is uh, uh dr ildeo talked about the the critical shoulder angle and uh some things are very clear in my mind uh, and some not of course so the thing is uh what i learned with the the critical shoulder angle is that uh, and, uh, we should not only do an antero-inferior acromioplasty, but also a lateral acromioplasty. And I have been doing this for about three or four years, so far so good, because you, uh, I care a lot about the, not only the, the number of the critical shoulder angle, but the idea of downsloping, the downs, the downsloping of the acromion. According to that paper, Uh, Gerber said that the insertion of the deltoid is not only lateral, in the lateral border of the bone or acromion, but also superior. You don't have to detach the, the deltoid, but uh, not detaching it, I pay, I pay a lot of attention to downsloping and to uh, do a lateral acromioplasty and not only anterior. And, and also, as Shirish said, We have to think about the the uh, the biological uh, the biological uh, aspects, which is the 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 blood coming uh, from the acromioplasty. So my question is to all of you panelists, and this is a beautiful one: Do you uh, care about lateral acromioplasty? I think this is good for beginners, and also. How much do you care about the critical shoulder angle? Because I know it, but I don't know what to do with it in my practice. 
So I think this is a good question. Uh, you deal any concerns about uh, how much the critical shoulder angle, I would say, have uh, and how can you apply it in your in your practice? Because I know it, but it doesn't change too much to me besides the idea of the lateral acromioplasty. How do you use it in your practice? I think this is a nice discussion and I would like to, to listen to the other panelists. I think we have changed the way of analyzing the acromion sh shape after and before the critical shoulder angle. Okay. Uh, we use it to, to use the Bigliani classification is here for, for 20 years. And now we know that the critical shoulder angle, I, I understand it's more important than the Bigliani classification because the, the lateral aspect of the acromion regarding the position of the cuff uh, is more important for the tears than the, the curve of anterior yeah. curve of it. Okay, so we, we, we know that when we do an, an anterior if you're acromioplasty, if you perform an MRI one year after, you are going to have the coracal acromial ligament intact again. So uh, the, the problem is that the impingement is not anterior inferior. In these cases of the critical shoulder angle, angle is open, the, the impingement is lateral. So you have to individualize your acromioplasty. That's the question. And I'm extremely happy to hear from Dr. Pathak that the, the, the growth factors and the biological is increased by doing an acromioplasty because I, I believe on, on that for many years, but I didn't have uh, uh, literature support to say that. And now I have, thank you very much. Oh, that's good. So Sanjay, uh, how the critical shoulder angle has changed your practice? And what do you think about lateral acromioplasty? I absorbed that idea for many years. I'm happy with that. What do you think about that? And um, my obviously thought, thanks, uh, Sergio, for this question. My thought process has been, you know, slightly different about this. Uh, the uh, effect of the acromion on the or impingement acquired uh, bursal type ro rotator cuff and. Uh, I have always thought whether it is the effect of the uh, loss of biomechanics of the shoulder forward elevation and abduction because of the tear, or it is the effect of the acromion itself. There has lot of, been a lot of struggle in my mind to understand that clearly. The Digliani classification considered this as a cause of the problem with the shoulder, Slowly, it became evident that it has been overplayed. And, and somehow, we, we, don't, we, we don't know if this is a cause or a consequence. Or we, effect, yeah. And, and this is the old discussion, Dr. Ryu Deo, uh, he, he was talking about that. The chicken and the egg, and the chicken exactly. and the egg. Who came exactly. first? But still, exactly. Deal. So critical I, shoulder I, angle is a new yeah. kid around the block, reinventing the theory of Bigliani's lateral sloping acromion. Uh, I am just keeping an eye on it. I am just noticing it, but I am not applied it into my management yet. I still continue doing uh, only in enterolateral sloping acromion. In my outlet view, I have uh, continued flattening that area. I'm still and, not touching the lateral side of the acromion and I'm waiting for solid evidence, high power study telling me that it reduces <laughs> the uh, retail rate. And then, you know, I, I'm in kind of, uh, you know, uh, I don't just catch on the early worms. I just try to uh, let it play, it let it play for a couple of years and see yeah. how, where it feels <laughs> and then fall. I am kind of follower of that philosophy. You okay, uh, yeah. Shirish, what are your concerns about this this discussion, this nice new, new idea, uh, relatively new idea? Yeah, so I think in 2017, we had Asian Congress uh, in Mumbai, India, and Christian Gerber did a presentation. And it was something new and it was, you know, quite exciting to learn about this new angle and everything. But I agree, I'm exactly in sync with Sanjay. I started observing them 
but I have not changed my surgical technique. Okay, okay. So different points of view, but that's part of the game. But there's a question that I'm going to ask uh, Shirish. It's coming from the audience about what is your experience with, with patches and scaffolds? Uh, my is none. And we were, we, we were in International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery seven months uh, last, last uh, year, which was organized also by, by you, Dale. And there was a presentation about that. And someone from, from uh, Canada, I guess, was telling that the results were very disappointing. The JAG graph and all of the other ones, because these scaffolds, they cannot reproduce bio biology for tendon in growth. Uh, so my, my perception is that they are quite frust frustrating, but I have absolutely no experience. Uh, have you done some, do you have any good results? And Dr. Iudeu and uh, Sanjay, what are your thoughts ab about scaffolds? So uh, in my practice, I've never used them for two reasons. As I said, they are not available. The one which is available uh, is porcine and it is very costly. So there are some religious reasons where people are not very keen to go ahead with this sort of uh, thermal patches. But uh, one of my senior colleagues from UK, Dr. Modi, he has done a very large series of graph jacket and he keeps coming to India and he has uh, presented his work and uh, the results are very promising. He has done more than 200 cases wow. uh, where the results are good with long-term follow-up. So, but I think with uh, newer options available slowly and the cost constraint, I think still it, it has not picked up so much in India. So no great experience with that. Yeah, me too. Uh, Sanjay, any thoughts? Uh, I concur with the series in India, uh, we haven't got any graph jackets. My exposure since year 2009, when I visited um, USA in prominent doctor Buckhead, and he was using this PRP uh, into the, you know, uh, to augment the healing in the repair in 2009, and this is 2020. Still on PRP front also, we have no conclusive evidence that whether it works or not, whether it works significantly, what kind of work, what combination, and they're all theories. It is a work in the right direction, but it has not reached to a point where we can conclusively come to an agreement. So all this, uh, you know, uh, current evolution in the healing augmentation is going in the right direction, but it's not yet there. That is my feeling right now. Okay, Dr. Uh, Dr. Liu, do you want to comment something about that? Yes, uh, I understand that these patches they do as a conduction uh, uh, aspect, and we have to increase biologically do injecting the PRP or now doing the acromioplasty. So here we have uh, our Switzerland one a patch which costs two thousand dollars. It's a four plus four centimeters. So it's very expensive. And uh, we are not allowed here in our state in Brazil, in Minas Gerais, to do the PRP at the moment because we had so many commercial issues involving it that they uh, it's prohibited at the moment. So now we, we have to wait a little bit more to do this kind of procedures, unfortunately. Okay, okay, good. So. Uh... Another thing that is coming, and I think that, well, that's something that I was thinking about. I, I have, a, I would say, uh, an interesting question to Shirish, which is, he was talking about the micro fractures and the idea of Crimson Duvet uh, talking uh, uh, about Steven Snyder. But I was thinking about something. Uh, uh, I already do some micro fractures or perforations when, when we put some anchors, we know that. And we don't have much bleeding because uh, the anchor is in place, but there is still some blood coming. But my question, I think it's a very interesting one. How much would you be afraid of having a greater tuberosity fracture doing 
micro fractures and the other perforations uh, with when putting anchors. See, so uh, <clears throat> when I do micro fracture, my idea is first step. What I would do is I will check the osteoporosis. I would okay. put the trocar and check uh, how strong is the bone. Okay, if I find it's quite osteoporotic, my typical sequence is I would never take away the cortical bone at the junction of the cartilage because there is the area where I want to put in my anchors. I would prefer anchors which are open ar architectural type, which will uh, allow a lot of bone marrow to come out and bone in growth as well. So fenestrated anchors. And whenever I do a uh, micro fracture, the lateral half of the footprint, there I concentrate primarily and I make sure that I don't, don't, don't go too deep I would make a perforation of about 5 millimeter uh, at a distance from each other and I won't go beyond 5 millimeter deep and I would avoid areas closer to the anchor because I don't want to make the anchor uh, weak by compromising the bone around the anchor. You don't have a pull out of the anchor of course. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. if, uh, if I find bone is too weak, then just a tuberoplasty is good enough. It is going to open a lot of channels. Okay. And which instrument do you use uh, to do the microfracture? Because uh, I couldn't understand. No, the, the same uh, choker with which I make a hole for 5.5 anchor, uh, the tip of that same instrument, I use it to create a microfracture. How? And... What is the biggest number you would do? Two or one or three? I would be afraid of, of doing more than one uh, and to create a, a, a fragility situation on greater tuberosity uh, and having a fracture. Because see, an intraoperative fracture of greater tuberosity would be a very complicated issue. I never uh, had it and I pray that I never have it in future. But having said that, how many perforations? Let's see yeah. that you are, put, three to you four. are putting three to four. Huh? Three to four. Okay. Uh, I guess that Dr. Liu Deo, you are raising your hand to say something about it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have a comment and a question for Dr. Pathak. Uh, I, I, I like to do the perforations. I use the, the perforator of 1.5 millimeters that we use for small anchors for uh, instability. And uh, we perform one perforation uh, and sometimes we do not need to use the hammer because the tuberosity is so soft, we so just uh, perforate it by hand. And my, I have a qu question about uh, how much do you debride the greater tuberosity? Because I, I found a paper telling that we do not have to remove everything, all the re reminiscence of the tendon, because uh, some uh, uh, parts of the tendon might induce the healing process, uh, stimulate the healing process or the uh, indifferentiated cells to tendon cells. And uh, saying that uh, uh, the biological uh, issue, I would like Dr. Patrick to say if there is any point of, uh, this is a true, that if you, you keep some part of the tendons, you know, parts of it uh, around the tuberosity, if it increases the biology or not, do you believe that we have to remove everything and perforate the tuberosity? No, most of the times uh, I, I try to do a double row transosseous uh, repair equivalent. And in those cases, uh, I try to clear off all soft tissues from the footprint and uh, do a extensive tuberoplasty, I would say, in the lateral part, make perforations and do a double row repair. So uh, I don't rely on the tendon tissue, but I would cl take a close look because that is going to tell me the tendon loss. But I don't try to preserve them. But yes, the anterior and posterior cable, I would definitely incorporate when I do the repair. I just want to make a comment. I think that 
everybody should listen to it carefully because I've been thinking about it too much. The most beautiful paper I saw, the most beautiful lecture I saw in International Congress last year was from a Japanese guy because he, may, he divided uh, some patients in three scenarios. The first one, a full tubero, tubero, uh, uh, plastic with a bony bed. The second one, he didn't do nothing and uh, he left the remaining tendon and the cartilage, not, not only the tendon. And the other one, he, he made a small debridement. And after uh, it was in, uh, um, uh, and, and after one year, something like that, he made, he, he came back, he picked a small piece of, uh, of the, the tendon and he sent this to histology. A beautiful paper, a, a lot of difficult to do this, but in Japan, I guess, the, pa the, the patient accepted to do a second look only for, I would say, uh, scientific reasons. And when he did the, the histological analysis, the quality of the scar was better in the cases in which he left some cartilage and some tendon in the insertion. So that would maybe change our minds not to do a full tuberoplasty, but to leave some cartilage over there together with some tendon. So that would be a new idea. And I have been thinking about it. It's new. And there was a guy from Chicago saying that considering this idea, he would do a, a in the greater tuberosity, a healing zone and a fixation zone. So uh, in, uh, in some part, he would leave the tendon and in the other one, he would uh, see the whole uh, bone to have a better idea of the purchase of the anchor. This is something very new. I guess that Dr. Ildeo was thinking about it, but you see this Japanese idea is, I'm, I'm really thinking ab about it. How much do I uh, shall uh, leave the native tendon of the, this insertion and how much do I must care about it to leave some, uh, some cartilage over there, to leave some tendon or to take it all? B because the old idea is to take it all as uh, Shidish was, was, was telling us. Uh, but have you been changing your mind, you deal about this? Because I have the sensation you are changing your, your, your mind. I'm yeah. trying to change, but I have the doubts and that Japanese paper, yeah. but no more papers I have seen. What, uh, can you clarify something about it, Dr. Ildeo? And if, so, and, and if someone wants to talk, I think that this is very interesting to discuss. Yeah. Uh, I have changed a little bit the way of doing the, uh, cleaning the tuberosity. Because uh, in the past, I used the soft tissue shaver first, and then I used a little bit of the bone uh, shaver. And now I, I just use the soft tissue ones. And if use, doing that, uh, it, uh, some tendons, uh, part of the tendon remains attached to the tuberosity, but just a small part of it, because I, I, I like to have a contact between the tendon and the bone. That's it. Okay, Sanjay wants to talk about it, huh? Um, my um, two penny worth is this, that uh, if it is a young patient post-traumatic care where there is a stump at the tuberosity, uh, I would leave it there and do a single row repair with uh, through the uh, tendon remnants, micro fracture, and just leave that everything to just gel on its own. But otherwise, in a degenerative kind of situation where there is hypovascularity at the, you know, this watershed area of the degenerated of care, I would need a good, you know, biology coming from the greater tuberosity and hence I would not really leave anything there. Uh, so I, have, so, I haven't come across that paper which you're talking yeah, about, Sergio. Yeah. Oh, no, no, okay. Uh, make an interesting yeah. read. Yeah. No, 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 it's very, it's very nice. But the thing is that you are trusting as we have trusted for years in a word which is blood you blood. trust in, yeah but the thing is that maybe it's not only blood but the remaining stump plays a, a bigger role that we were thinking about this is something that we really should think about 
And but just just changing a little because I want to give uh, attention to the the audience. Someone is asking. I I have a, I have a absolutely no response. Uh, if if you uh, I guess I guess Doctor Ildeo has more experience about it. If you do uh, some some laser and ultrasound in the beginning of the physiotherapy, do you think that this uh, this devices of these uh, tools can increase the biology of the tendon? Uh, I have absolutely no idea, but the coming is question from the audience. The, the question. Uh -huh. Well, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, resources to increase the healing process, uh, mechanical or thermal or biological. Never so, <coughs> Uh, if if we have uh, a, a good uh, young guy, I think we don't need that because the the biological response is very good. We we are going to have the inflammatory phase, okay, and we are going to have the the healing process done without problems. But we if we have a chronic tear uh, old guy, I think we can use some of these resources uh, like uh, ultrasound or laser to increase the inflammatory response because these patients sometimes they, they do not have uh, this big response. So uh, that's my, I don't have a paper or uh, to, to, to confirm. This is something I feel by, based on my experience. Sanjay, any thoughts? Uh, for the bone healing, ultrasonic waves has been tried, but for tendon healing, I don't think, uh, you know, anything other than, you know, blood, which is inside at the repair site <laughs> works. <laughs> yeah. Shirish. So, uh, not for healing, but sometimes uh, certain patients have too much of pain. So, we use uh, TENS, transcutaneous uh, electrical stimulation, to relieve pain and to avoid, uh, you know, high dosage of uh, anti inflammatories. Okay, because where well, uh, Doctor Doctor Ildeo was talking about something very interesting, because this is something that I face. I think that we we can discuss this. The thing is, uh, Burkhardt said that in big tears you will have much less pain than in in small tears post operatively. The problem is that especially in women with small tears, I've been having a, a lot of cases of post. Uh, operative stiffness. And the thing is, as Ildeo has said, stiffness, stiffness I can manage. Failure, I cannot manage. But the problem is that I had some cases last year about CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, reflex uh, sympathetic uh, uh, dystrophy, which they give me a lot of work. So I know how to manage that because I do a lot of uh, fractures, but, and then I, I have to, to enter with uh, gabapentin, pre, pre gabalin, C uh, vitamin, B, B uh, uh, complexes, and it gives me a lot of difficulty. So the thing is, how do you manage, how do you manage to avoid stiffness, it's a difficult question, and CRPS, which is a bad issue. I know how to manage, but when it comes, it's a mess. Okay, so uh, in my experience, uh, I, I am not doing uh, partial thickness tear for uh, young ladies anymore, repair for young ladies because I had the same uh, situation of uh, frozen shoulder after these repairs, because I, I think that the biological response is too high. And these uh, patients, sometimes they, they go very well doing a conservative management, conservative treatment. So uh, do, uh, saying that, I try to identify the risk factors for a frozen shoulder before the surgery. And if I have uh, a lady uh, 50s or 55 year old, years old, very anxious, very uh, 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 diabetic patient, uh, patients with metabolic problems uh, of thyroid or 
other problems. And patients that uh, needs a medication, central medications for sleeping, and these uh, patients, they are more uh, uh, tendent to have frozen shoulder after surgery. So uh, in these cases, uh, I talk to the patient and I try to use some uh, painkillers before the operation, two days before the operation. It's like a preemptive uh, analgesia. So uh, after the operation, I try to do a multimodal uh, protocol using not only anti-inflammatory drugs, non-steroid inflammatory drugs for five days, uh, uh, not more than that, not to interfere in the healing process. And I use some different kind of drugs as well, like you, you, you told us uh, that you use for treating the complication. So I think that it, when I, I start seeing that the patient is having too much pain after the surgery, I, I, I have no, no, no problem doing a, a suprascapular nerve block uh, straight away. So that's the way I try. And I stop doing the, the re, uh, uh, rehabilitation regarding movement because I keep the patient comfort in the sling and I, I, uh, the protocol for rehabilitation is just for pain in the beginning. So I, 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 I just start moving the arm uh, after having the pain controlled. This is very important. And my experience uh, with suprascapular nerve blocks is very big. I'm very happy with that. Uh, 13 years doing that. Uh, Dr. Ildeu seems to do it all. So it's very good for frozen shoulder. I know it's a big discussion. And for CRPS, reflex sympathetic dis dis dystrophy. Uh, but how do you, uh, what your experience, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay and uh, Shirish on dealing uh, with uh, pain in stiffness and CRPS? Do you have it, yes or no? And what do you think about suprascapular nerve blocks? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, 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 the thing is, doctor, uh, this is a very nice discussion. We have something like more 30 minutes to discuss as long as we wish. I would like to keep here all day because it's a lot of, 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 of things. But the thing is, we still have 30 minutes. So I think this is very important because it's not uh, the success, as we have discussed, it, is not what I do intraoperatively. It's what I do preoperatively, intraoperative, and postoperatively. Uh, so uh, it's not only about how to conduct a post op rehabilitation, but in identifying post op uh, problems and how to manage that. You all know that I, I am absolutely uh, in, in the right way of thinking. So uh, please, Shirish and then uh, Sanjay, your experience with uh, uh, complex regional pain, how do you manage that medication, suprascapular nerve blocks? I think this is a very productive discussion, please. Yeah, so Sanjay, you mean it's a post-op uh, case with uh, yeah. uh, RSD, right? Yes. So I think, first of all, while selecting patients for repair, I would be very selective if someone who has a partial articular tear, a diabetic, a hypothyroid patient, uh, and, you know, very apprehensive about the result, I would prefer to avoid this kind of patient because I know this sort of patient would give a lot of trouble in post-operative period. If at all, if we decide, then I would always go ahead with the down in a partial rotator uh, uh, cuff tears. I would not do a transtendinous repair. So I'm more comfortable taking a complete the tear and do a proper repair because the, the part of the tendon, which is still uh, macroscopically intact, it has been shown in literature that histologically it is abnormal. So better to get rid of that tissue. Those, in those patients, I would be, as I said, individualized post-op rehab protocol. I would be a little aggressive in early post-op period. I would start early passive range of movement, early pendular hangs, most importantly, external rotation uh, exercise. I would start from day one. Third, uh, yes, I, I use suprascapular nerve blocks uh, and uh, transdermal patches in such patients. Uh, pregabalin, gabapentin, they of of a great help uh, in treating them, and you have to counsel them that this is going to be all right, and it is going to take at least six to eight months. That's what I tell them on day one. 
and so in few of my patient i have taken help of my colleague who is a pain specialist and we have done some steroid ganglion blockades and everything and uh, i think you have to just buy time you know for 6 months by the time you know the natural history also you know no. cures the sure and and another thing that i'm very serious uh, dr eudeo i want you to come and sanjay you see this this kind of patient especially young uh, middle aged ladies it happens a little bit more there is literature about it but i think i'm very serious that you must spend time talking to them talk 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 you must give her emotional attention because this kind of patients they they need more psycho emotional attention it's difficult to find literature about it it's very easy to see in the office so it's medication and emotional support i'm very serious i don't know if you have this patients in in india i have a lot and yes, um, yes and to and i'm and i'm going to be very serious i think that in that age they have these ladies they have problems because i'm very serious the kids they are uh, leaving home so the motherhood is not so strong uh, to feel her her emotions every day and then you see sometimes i'm very serious the marriage is a little bit wasted all of these things they play a role and i make some jokes with my residents when they get older they have grandkids and then the mind gets better because they can feel their they their emotions in a different way i'm very serious because i see this when they have grand grand uh, grand kids it goes better okay it's a personal 15 year uh, 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 perception but i talk a, a lot a lot with them to give them emotional support I think this is very important in this kind of patient in this kind of post op Dr. Yudeo do you have any concerns about giving them uh, I would say some emotional co- uh, comfort I'm very serious ab- about this I'm 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 serious what do you think uh, about it then uh, Sanjay in this specific kind of patient Can I go yes. Please No no please you can go Sanjay Okay so uh... sir you these are very difficult cases which you are talking about so during the clinics i tend to keep my radar really really up for this and i try to conserve them as far as possible but once in year i get caught in this so when this is a pasta or partial articular cuff tear and i take the challenge to make them little happier counseling counseling and counseling so And that is very important and then during the surgery i take care of bursa more aggressively wherever i see red i just go and clear it out i release their capsule proactively so that whatever effect of the secondary stiffness is there i get ahead of that then i use interscalene block with if possible with a catheter so that for a couple of days that patient is pain free and then i use uh, uh, this uh, opioid uh, uh, patches pentajosin patches and uh, along with that i add little bit of antidepressant and then you know keep them very close you call them frequently for follow up and give them enough time they chew your brain but in the end say at the end of 6 to 7 months Uh, they are better you know they are better and one thing i do at the beginning i charge them double <laughs> <laughs> that's very good that's fantastic you know i'm i'm very happy to know that all of these 50 60 year old ladies with emotional weakness i would say they are not only in, in brazil they happen in india i'm very happy about it shirish uh any concerns about this i would say this middle aged ladies which this uh, emotional allow me to use the word not weakness but characteristic do you pay more attention to them post operatively you know they uh, i i i love it the the expression sanja use it they chew your brain so they and they chew my brain too and they chew my heart 
because they are emotionally demanding. So how do you manage that Chirish on a, uh, I would say, uh, on a regular practice? Because I want to know that you suffer as much as I do. <laughs> Sergio, I, I should confess, uh, now I'm practicing for last 12 years, but still this sort of patient where they, when they come to my outpatient, still they give palpitations because uh, you know that next 20, 25 minutes are gone and you have to keep talking to them. But I think it's very important. I always call uh, their uh, uh, close relatives, especially if she's an elderly lady, I would call her daughter-in-law. And you have to make sure that daughter-in-law understands that she, she is not a malingerer. It's a real problem. She's suffering because from outside, they feel that she's just making some fuss. So I make sure that every uh, family member understand this is a problem. And together we have to find a solution. And I think this few uh, detailed counseling sessions are good enough. And uh, you have to just make uh, sure that they don't feel that you are trying to avoid them. Rather, I tell them that either you come early in my outpatient hours or you come last so that I can give you more time. So I Lovely. think a couple of sessions and if you convince them that you're going to get all right, they, they are okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, sometimes my physical therapists, they say, they make a joke that these ladies, they don't need so much physiotherapy, but they need psychotherapy. So it's another way of, uh, of seeing this. But there is a nice question coming. Uh, I, there is a wonderful uh, shoulder surgeon in the state where Dr. Uh, Ildeo uh, lives, Minas Gerais, Dr. Mota, José da Mota, he lives in a city called Juiz de Fora. He's a very good friend of mine, outstanding surgeon. And he's asking me a question here in WhatsApp because he deals a lot with athletes and I don't deal with athletes, it's very uncommon. He's asking me if you think differently when you are dealing with pesta lesions in athletes and not in ordinary patients. Uh, you see, I have a, a way of thinking of PESTA for non-athletes. My experience with, with athletes is very small. Dr. Mota, he has a big experience. And I would like you to know, do you think differently to deal with PASTA lesions in high demand in patients from an athletic point of uh, practice? I uh, would like us to talk about it, please. Uh, Dr. Ildeo, can you start? Well, uh, based on the, the papers, um, I can say that I like to perform, the, the, to complete the lesion, to have a 100% repair in these cases, because uh, the, the biological aspect of the, the healing process is, uh, is stronger uh, when compared when you do a partial repair. That's the way I, I like to, to do it. I don't have too many experience to athletes, but uh, regarding these uh, partial articular tears, I feel more confident doing a 100% repair uh, because I can control the tension and I can control the exact uh, part uh, where I'm going to reinsert the tendon. That's my experience. Okay, so uh, my feeling is the same because uh, Burkhardt says that in partial tears, you must take all of the bad uh, uh, tissue from, uh, I, I would say, a macroscopical point of view. But what Ildeo has said is absolutely as my feelings that the biological potential in this patient is very high because they, are, I would say, they are younger and then uh, they have good biology and the thing is, uh, so I really think like that, but uh, what is your experience you do and then the others with athletes? Because mine is so small. Uh, uh, what is your experience and, and acting like that intraoperatively, how do you see them six months, eight months, uh, one year after surgery in sports activity? Do they really get better? The question is that these shoulders, they are not uh, young anymore. 
because these guys they have a high demanding activity so That's sometimes in a, in a patient uh, of uh, 25 or 30 years old we have a 60 or 70 years old shoulder so uh, they have to understand the limits of it so i i talk too much about them about the the limits of the the treatment and how can we improve uh, biologically and uh, the protocols of uh, post-operative uh, are a little bit uh, uh, different because they have uh, uh, different phases to to cover because it, depending on the uh, sports that they are involved in, like tennis, like uh, volleyball, uh, like soccer, uh, we need to do some specific uh, post-operative uh, protocols to, to put these guys at the same level that before surgery. So it's not easy. And sometimes you have to do more than one operation in these guys. That's the problem. Okay, and then, and then I'm going to do a very interesting question. When you have a 30-year-old uh, boy with a serious pasta tear that needs surgery, you know that the problem is not exactly impingement, but intrinsic tendon degeneration, okay? Having said that, would you still do an acromioplasty, even a, a, a smooth, just to have some bleeding upon the repair? I, I, I guess you will say yes, but it's still a nice question. I think in this case, sometimes you can do injection into the tendon, into that uh, the, uh, intrasubstance of the tendon, because uh, doing just an acromioplasty, probably the cells are not going to achieve the part of the tendon which is degenerated. So uh, I like uh, to open a little bit longitudinally the tendon and to create a, a, a path to use the, the shaver and, and debride it a little bit. And in this way, after that, I do a suture over the top to close the tendon. That's the way I do it. Okay, Sanjay, your experience with uh, pasta lesions in athletes to Dr. Mota, who is very in, in, uh, in, interested in this topic, and Shirish, be, because my experience is very small. So uh, my experience is also very small, but in athletes, in younger athletes, I tend to really, you know, treat them conservatively. And when I operate, I do a completion of tear, repair, good vasectomy and rehab, early mobilization. And I need to tell them that your post-operative level in the performance is not going to be you know, improved or amazing. You will have to understand that. It's up to him. I just uh, uh, shift onus to him to use this surgery as his advantage and, and bring best out of him and uh, you know uh, adapt to this new uh, issue and re-educate and then perform. That is my strategy. But very small volume uh, where in a, in a, in a my style of practice if the, in these cases. Uh, Shirish. You are muted. Oh. No, 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 no. I have treated a few of them. So I think when you are dealing a, a overhead throwing athlete, it's a throw shoulder. So we can't just look at the pasta lesion alone. I would make sure that all components are well taken care of, looking at the scapular dyskinesia, the internal rotation deficit. I would put uh, them on a good supervised pro program where we would stretch out his uh, posterior capsule, put them on good scapular rehab, strengthening program, sports specific training, and most of them, they get better. Now I would divide these athletes into two groups. One who is still continuing to play at whatever level, state level or national level, I am very reluctant to touch them because the return to sports after surgery in the worldwide literature the percent is very less. But someone who has played for a lot of years and now he's out of the game, out of the team because of this injury, 
then these are the patient where after a adequate rehab trial if they are not getting better then i would counsel them that yes we can try our best but i am not sure but at least you should be able to get back to sport may not be at the same level but you should be there and then with a uh, well informed consent uh, we try our best and few of our patient they still manage to get back to the same level uh, uh, what was their pre injury but still the chances of having recurrent pain and getting back to the clinic is very high no and so what are you saying and and um, uh, it's very uh, uh, clear for you me but and all of the uh, the panelists but i'm talking to the audience we must be very honest with these patients in a way that see i'm going to uh, uh, try my best but i cannot uh, promise you that you will come back or or you will come back i would say uh, re recreatively but not in a competitive uh, level and you see the problem is that you are getting old it's not me the surgeon is you are you are getting old and this is very important but the thing is we have to pay a lot of attention in scapular dyskinesia because this is important in everybody uh, especially in athletes because they are high high demanding but there is uh, then one thing that i want to question because it's very difficult to me and uh, and i want to see if you suffer as i do the thing is i pay a lot of attention in scapular dyskinesia post operatively is very important especially if i am uh, if i am acting with recreative middle aged sport people uh, in the gym these cases i can handle well the problem is that in old patients especially in obese ladies and and, and they have spine cyphosis uh, in english is uh, kyphosis it's very difficult to to work with the scapulas even if you operate the shoulders they are the 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 cuffs they are low demanding patients but i have a lot of difficulty in i would say um uh, treating scapular dyskinesia in old patients especially in obese ladies with uh, kyphosis do you have this same difficulties and how do you try to improve it post operatively after a cuff repair i think this is a, a difficult question but a practical one dr ilde how do you suffer do you suffer too well uh, i think we have to pay attention about the origin of the pain in these cases because some of these ladies they have uh, pain on the ac joints because of the position of the scapula regarding the the rest of the body so the protraction of the scapula increases the pressure over the ac joint and the sternoclavicular joint as well so some of these ladies they have what we call an uh, um, how how can i say it in english it's the the pec minor uh, over uh, tension okay and, it's a and, uh, no uh, uh, just a second uh, and you will continue now uh, is the pec minor over tension leading to myofascial pain this is what you want to mention myofascial pain yes yeah so uh, the, the, i think the key point in this case is to perform a proper strengthening of the scapular muscles and stretching the pec pec minor and pec major muscles and sometimes even the subscapularis. So uh, it's difficult because these ladies, they are lazy and they, do not, uh, they don't like to do some exercises daily. So simply they do not uh, uh, do the treatment properly. So uh, in these cases, it, it's difficult. And we, we sometimes we indicate the, the surgery uh, uh, trying to compensate uh, 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 conservative treatment that was not done in a proper way in trying to do using surgery. And this is not a good thing to do because they are going to complicate. I think this, uh, we have to try to, to treat conservatively as much and, as we can. Yes, and as Sanjay has said, and after surgery, if they are not fully okay, they are going to chew your brain. I love the expression, Sanjay, okay, because they chew my, my but I say my brain and my heart. But oh, yeah. still, Sanjay, 
uh, about scapular, uh, the scapular part of rehabilitation, old ladies, obese, when you operate the cuffs, they are low demanding. I have so much difficulty to work this part physiotherapically in post-op scenario. Uh, your thoughts about it? How do you deal with that? So um, the one thing is that I commence this uh, exercises before the surgery, the scapular stabilization exercises. So they are familiar with these exercises once I operate. And as soon as uh, you know they are out of anesthesia and they're comfortable, say, four or five hours after the surgery, they start at least brace, scapular bracing exercises. And uh, I, I put them on those uh, table slides and uh, you know just elbow exercises. And then in the next phase, when I mobilize them passively to control the scapula, I ask them at home, the supine exercises, they lie down and their scapula are touching the bed and then they do passive exercises. And that educates that scapula and their muscles to, to really you know, act rhythmically. So to, to avoid this sitting position, shrugging uh, uh, or uh, what you call trick movements, I want them to do passive exercises in initial six to uh, you know eight weeks if they, it's a big tear in a lying down position. That is my trick. Okay, uh, 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 we are finishing just in a second, but... Shirish, do you want to make final comments? Because you didn't uh, answer. I just want to hear your thoughts and then we will finish. Shirish, so, any thoughts yeah. about this? Yeah, so I think you, you have to make patient aware about the scapular issues. And we have a, a good uh, shoulder rehab team. Uh, so where we advised post-operatively a uh, few supervised sessions and we sort of tell patient that uh, surgery is only 50%. 50% is a proper rehabilitation. And if you do it, then only you'll get the good result. And I think most of the patients follow that rehab protocols and we have very good results with uh, supervised rehab protocol in early post-op period. And then sequentially, they keep coming uh, two weeks, eventually four weeks later for follow-up visit with physiotherapy. And we make it sure that we work on the scapula very well right from day one. Okay. So see my friends, it was a lovely discussion, but we have to finish because Dr. Rashok has a lot of uh, webinars to run. Uh, before my final statements, uh, Dr. Yudeo, do you wanna make any final comments? Sanjay, uh, yeah, we have uh, one or two minutes for, for everyone to speak if you wish, of course. Dr. Yudeo, any final statements? Feel, feel free, my friend. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ortho TV. I would like to thank uh, Shoulder Planets. That's my thank mug you. here. And lots of Brazilian guys, they are asking for one. Okay, please be aware of it. Yeah, um, thank you. We also want one. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. I promise. <laughs> yeah. And I, I really, I'm really happy and honored to be part of this discussion. And thanks for the opportunity. And Sergio, uh, you have done a lot of Brazilian shoulder surgery, and I, I would like to congratulate you and your relationship between uh, India and Brazil. You have established a, a channel of uh, communication, and this is very important for both of uh, both countries. So, congratulations for all of all of you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, you. I'm very. I am very happy about it. Sanjay, if you want to say something, you, uh, the sure. microphone is yours. Right. Sergio, I, it is my privilege to interact like this freely without constraint of time, speaking our mind and heart to heart discussion on this uh, Ortho TV uh, facilitated webinar on your shoulder planet uh, platform. Thank you very much for making me part of it. And yes, I thank my fellow, fellow participants for their participation and listening to me very patiently. Thank okay, you. thank you. Shirish, do you want to say something yeah, to, so to finish? Thank you, Ashok. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you, Sergio. 
uh, Sanjay and uh, Dr. Ido. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic academic feast. Okay, so see, uh, this one, one of, to be very honest, this one of the most beautiful moments of all of my uh, Indian, uh, I would say, uh, in day of war that started 10 years ago. Uh, I'm very thankful, uh, li like my Indian friends do, they do like this. So Namaste. thank you a lot, Dr. Ashok. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I thank you too much, Orto TV, the formal and very uh, brotherhood that we are establishing. I hope that we can continue this, this, uh, this uh, uh, projects. And I'm very happy that in a very spontaneous way, Dr. Ashok, he, he, he mentioned this as an Indo-Brazil event, because this is not my event. This is an Indo-Brazil ev event. I think we have to join forces to be stronger together, to use internet, uh, I'm very happy about it, uh, I, I, and as long as we can, I hope we can do in future more events like this, connecting Brazil with uh, not only with India, but with people from other countries. I think that this is the spirit. I'm very happy about it. Dr. Ashok, do, uh, if you want to say something to finish it, uh, I'm going to be delighted, my good friend. Yeah. I think it was a really great event. We were joined by around, I think 900 to 1000 people joined us online and watched the thing. Uh, the discussion was very lively and a lot of things about the biology of uh, RCT and how the repair heals. A lot of concepts were clear, especially with the discussion amongst the panelists. So uh, it was a really good uh, webinar and added a lot of academic value to the viewers. And like you said, it's an uh, Indo-Brazilian venture and we should look uh, in uh, ahead in doing this regularly as much as possible for both of us. And we involve more people into it so that we can share knowledge across continents and across the world. So Okay, uh, uh, just a final statement that I, I am very proud to say that uh, um, uh, if, if, if we can do a, uh, another one, I am delighted. And just for people to know that I have invited one of the most important uh, persons nowadays of the world uh, shoulder scenario, which is our good friend, Dr. Osvandre Lech, which is not only a good friend of Dr. Ildeo and of me, Dr. Ildeo helped me in the invitation, I thank, publicly Dr. Ildeo to invite Dr. Oswandre Lech, who was not only ex-president of Brazilian Orthopedic Society, but Brazilian Shoulder and Elbow Society. And he's now the president of International Board of Shoulder and Elbow Society. He's a very important guy, very proactive, very, very clever man, very intelligent. And he has already accepted the invitation as long as we can do a second event. So I am super uh, proud of saying that. And we have uh, other guys to invite uh, of uh, very important people from, uh, 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 I would say, abroad. I don't have the yes, but we are trying. Dr. Ildeo is giving me super support on that. So the thing is, uh, I just want this to be the start of a new, I would say, uh, digital relation between Brazil and India. I'm very proud of that and very happy. And I hope to see you guys soon, as long as we can, of course, in a second event. Yeah. As long as Orto TV give us the opportunity, I, I yeah. guess we will have. And, the, and see, and the biggest responsible for all of this journey is Dr. Ashok, Dr. Niraj. They are extremely active and thank you from the bottom of my heart, my good friends. I think Neeraj coordinated all of them and he can uh, end the meeting with uh, okay. his final okay, words. Neeraj. Go ahead, Neeraj. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we will definitely do it on a regular basis. We will coordinate again. We will keep that group on so that it will be very easy for us to coordinate. So with this, we end our meeting. We end our first Indo-Brazilian shoulder meeting today. Thank you very much and bye-bye. So my friends, I hope you like it. So please don't forget, subscribe, 
give your thumbs up, leave your comment, and see you in the next video. As Dr. Sergio always says, never stop flying. See you, my good friends.